Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to welcome you to our study or lesson prep for Mosiah chapters 25 to 28 this week. My goal is to help you teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. Now, if you'd like the lesson plans or the PowerPoint slides or the handouts that I used in these lessons, please go to teachingwithpower.com, and you're going to find links to my channel, my blog, and my shop. So I encourage you to grab your scriptures and your marking pencils, because it's time to dig deep. I want to start with just a quick summary of Mosiah chapter 25. With the Mulekites, King Mosiah's people, Limhi's people, and Alma's people all united in the city of Zarahemla, we have the establishment of a community collectively called Nephites, or the people of God. And we also have King Mosiah commissioning Alma to set up the church or different congregations of the church throughout the land. But one quick thought here, though. I do enjoy this little section from about verses 7 to 12, where Mosiah reads the records of Zenith and Alma to the people. And they have a number of different reactions to the scriptures here. They seem to have some conflicting emotions. At one moment, they're filled with wonder and amazement, and the next, they have exceedingly great joy. Then they're weeping with sorrow, and then they're raising their voices in gratitude, and then they're filled with pain and anguish for the Lamanites. It's a bit of a roller coaster of emotions here. But what a great example of the power of engaged scripture study. These people are internalizing the scriptures. Their minds and their hearts are connected to the people and the message of the scriptures. They open their minds and their hearts to God's words. And another significant thing here, a number of the people change their names to Nephites because of what they learn from the scriptures. They're actually applying the scriptures to their lives and making changes because of it. And we could learn from that. How do you study the scriptures? Do you engage that way? Do you engage with them mentally, emotionally, spiritually? Do you rejoice when they rejoice, weep when they weep, mourn when they mourn, and learn what they learn? I promise you that when the scriptures will come alive for you when you do that. They're designed to cover the full range of human emotion and experience. That's why I love them so much. And, and that's the reason why, as old as the scriptures are, they never get old. But where I really want to begin to dig deep is Mosiah chapter 26. I think there's a crucial lesson for parents and children in these first couple of verses. And as an icebreaker, it might be kind of fun to get your students thinking about how things have changed from their parents' generation to their generation. So what I'd ask is, how is your generation different from your parents' generation? And that can be a really fun conversation to have. I'm sure they're going to bring up things like clothing styles, music, television shows, catchphrases, and things like that. But they also might bring up deeper differences. One generation was more frugal and another more ambitious. One generation more conservative in values, another more open-minded. One generation that valued hard work and another valued enjoyment and leisure. These generational transformations can be so pronounced that we even begin to distinguish them with labels like the greatest generation, baby boomers, generation X, millennials, and so forth. Well, in Mosiah chapter 26, verse 1, we have two forces or mindsets that are often at opposition with each other, one looking forward and the other looking back. Can you find those two things in that verse? And on the one hand, you have the rising generation, and on the other, the tradition of their fathers. And in this case, these two forces are at odds with each other. They're in conflict. The rising generation in Zarahemla is rejecting the traditions of their fathers. And I'm sure that you've all seen this type of dynamic played out in your own lifetimes as well, where the younger generation seeks to throw off the conventions of the former. I think that every generation in some way faces that issue, but there are some more pronounced examples of that within the past century. Uh, you've got the youth of the 1920s casting off the traditional Victorian ideals of the early 1900s. You have the counterculture of the 60s 
throwing off the idealized morality of the greatest generation. And now I believe we're seeing another pronounced break between the baby boomer generation and millennials. I mean, even just the very label itself, millennial, maybe exacerbates that, uh, fans the flame of them feeling like they're different, they're new. It's a new millennium, right? I know that I have witnessed a confrontational attitude coming from both sides of that gap there. The question is, does it always have to be that way? Is one side bad and the other good? Are generations doomed to be just one knee-jerk reaction after another to the previous generation? I don't think so. I feel both sides have something positive to offer and then some pitfalls to be aware of. And if both sides can understand that, maybe we can reconcile the two and get them moving in the same direction. So what positives do the rising generation bring to the table? I would say vitality, ambition, the ability to look at old problems in new ways, and a willingness to embrace change. Those are good things that should be encouraged and admired. However, there is a caution that the rising generation needs to consider. Don't overdo it. In your efforts to be different and progressive and open-minded, don't give in to the temptation to completely reject the past. Don't separate yourselves from your heritage, your legacy, and from the tried and true values of the past. And while it's often healthy to throw off some of the provincial cultural norms and embrace new things, be careful not to throw out doctrine and morality and standards in the same process. Now, for the tradition of the father's side, or the, I, I don't want to say older, but established generation, their positive side is their loyal, true to the faith that our parents have cherished attitude. They find stability and meaning and inspiration in their connection to their heritage and their roots. They help protect society from repeating the same mistakes over and over again. Their experience and their wisdom should be recognized and respected. But there are some warnings for them, too. They tend to be narrow-minded, uh, clinging to past practices, and they often struggle to distinguish between that which is eternal and that which is merely cultural. Sometimes they clutch at certain practices because, well, that's just how it's always been done. So some advice to both the fathers and the rising generation. Tradition of the father's side? Be open to change. Seek to recognize the difference between eternal principles and that which is only cultural. Be careful not to quickly dismiss the views and ideas of the rising generation. Embrace their vitality and innovation. Rising generation? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You disconnect yourself completely from your heritage at your own peril. You also need to seek to recognize that which is eternal in nature, even when it might be difficult to live. Following Christ will always require sacrifice, faith, and a willingness to be separate from the world. We can't do away with those things. And if we can just strike the proper balance between those two things, instead of being in opposition, wouldn't it be great if we could just get both the rising generation energy to match the tradition of the Father's energy? and move them in the same upward trajectory. Just think, if the rising generation were able to completely take charge of the church, what standards, eternal principles, and critical practices might be cast aside in the naivety of youth? No wonder our church is led by those of the established generation. But also, just think, if the church had never been willing to progress with the rising generation and make changes, would women still be wearing pioneer dresses and remain confined to the home without the vote? I've often wondered if our policy on race and the priesthood in the past falls into this category of a cultural phenomenon that, thank heavens, changed, a gift from the rising generation. How wonderful that the church has been able to make progress along with the rest of society. Some things need to remain stable. And some things need to move. Like in the solar system, the sun remains stable, but the earth moves. 
The church is the same way. I love how the Doctrine and Covenants describes the church. It's called the true and living church. Two very important descriptive terms. So you have true, foundational, eternal, unchanging, tradition of the fathers. But it's also living, change, progress, adaptability, vitality, rising generation. The church has to be and is both. And I think we're always going to be safe if we're following the living prophets. I mean, just look at the current leadership of the church. Many changes have been made that I think most of us would agree could be labeled as progressive and transformative. Changes in our youth programs, church meeting duration, policies regarding the gay community, adjustments to the temple ceremony, and so on. At the same time, you see them firmly rooted in and committed to our past. The new proclamation to the world just released in General Conference is a good example of this, firmly rooting the church in the bedrock of the Restoration. I believe they strike the perfect balance between the new and the old, the rising and the tradition. So let's be sure to keep our eyes and hearts on the brethren. And if we do that, we'll never go wrong. But let's return to our matter at hand, the rising generation of Zarahemla rejecting the traditions of the fathers. I believe that this is a fear that all faithful parents harbor. I know I worry about this. I ask myself, will I be able to pass my faith on to my children? Can I pass the flame from me to them like an Olympic torch? In this case, they haven't succeeded in doing this. The flame has not been passed. And I think we have to be careful about being too quick to blame the parents in these cases. You'll see that here, there's no blame assigned to the moms and dads of Zarahemla. Parents can do almost everything right and still have children who stray. Rather than blame fathers and mothers here, Mormon describes what he felt happened to this generation. And if we can understand what happened, maybe we can take steps to prevent it from happening to us. And our children. I think I see a progression in these first few verses of Mosiah 26, from verses 1 to 4. Read them and then put the following statements in chronological order. The first problem is that they did not believe. They didn't believe the tradition of their fathers. They didn't believe in the resurrection, and they didn't believe in the coming of Christ. And just like faith is the first principle of the gospel, anti-faith is the first step away from it. And what does an absence of faith cause in verse 3? A lack of understanding. Now I do see that it does say that the reason they didn't believe is because they couldn't understand the words of King Benjamin because they were little children at the time that he spoke to them. And to me, the not understanding in verse 1 is different from the not understanding of verse 3. The understand in verse 1 is a mental or a, a cognitive understanding. They didn't understand because they were infants and toddlers. They couldn't even grasp the concept of language at that point, let alone the message that was being taught. So yes, in that sense, we do need to be intellectually aware before we can have faith. But the not understanding in verse 3 is the not understanding of the heart. And that's the critical issue here. And a lack of understanding leads to a hardened heart. And a hardened heart leads to a refusal to make covenants, which leads you to separate yourself from God's people. And if you separate yourself from God's people, you won't call upon God. And as long as they refuse to call upon God, they're going to remain in their carnal and sinful state indefinitely. I know you may have wanted to put not calling upon God as the last step, but it's worded so that's the cause of their final state of remaining sinful. So I put that step second to last. I think the world gets things backwards, especially when it comes to matters of faith. The world is going to say, I'll believe it when I see it. 
or I'll believe it when I understand it. But I don't understand why I have to follow all these rules. I won't pay my tithing because I don't understand why I should have to. I won't keep my media choices pure because I don't understand why it's a big deal. I won't get baptized or serve a mission or get married in the temple because I don't understand the importance of these things. But God says no. Faith first. Believe and then you will see. Believe enough to act on these things, to experiment upon my word. If you want to understand tithing, believe in the principle of tithing enough to pay it. Then the testimony and the understanding will come. Believe in the principle of commandments and standards enough to live them. Then the belief or understanding will come. Jesus Christ taught this principle in John 7:17. 7, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Believe enough to do. Then the knowledge and the understanding is sure to come. So what's a parent to do? Maybe there's a hint here. When your children are young, when they're still believing and naturally trusting of you as their parents, be sure to help them to do what a disciple does. If you wait until their teenage years, it may be too late. Be sure to take them with you each week to church. Study the scriptures with them. Pray with them. Help them to pay their tithing. Let them see you doing all these things. I know of a father who, for a time, didn't really emphasize going to church with his family. Their attendance was very sporadic. Instead, they'd often go boating, on vacations, or to sporting events on Sunday instead. He felt justified by saying that spending recreational time with his family was, in his eyes, just as beneficial as church. That same father was very dismayed when his children, one by one, as they got older, decided not to serve missions or marry in the temple or to go to church at all. So, start young. Let them see you living and loving your faith. Let them hear you bear your testimony. Let them catch you studying your scriptures or saying your prayers or sharing the gospel. This isn't a fail-proof strategy. I mean, you can do almost everything right and still lose them but you can stack the odds in your favor that a legacy of faith will be passed to the rising generation by focusing on that essential first step. And then perhaps the opposite progression will happen. Instead of not believing, they will gain faith. And with that faith, they will understand the word of God. And if they understand, their hearts will be softened and they'll be willing to make a covenant. And if they're willing to make a covenant, they'll have a desire to associate with other members of Christ's church. And if they're willing to associate with the church, they will call upon God. And if they call upon God, they'll be better able to put off a carnal and sinful state. So, parents and established generation, look to the rising generation. I think it behooves us to do everything in our power to pass our faith and understanding on to them through our example and our love. Let's try not to criticize or belittle or strong-arm them, but embrace and value their vitality and their forward movement. Rising generation, look to the fathers. Learn from them. Recognize their experience and their wisdom. Root yourselves firmly in the past at the same time as you stretch your branches higher into the sky. Together, we can avoid this Zarahemla-type setback and move our true and living church closer and closer to Christ's millennial reign. Before this chapter ends, another thought. In an answer to a troubled prayer from Alma over the rebellious souls of the rising generation, the Lord teaches some key principles of forgiveness. In fact, this chapter gives us some of my favorite fundamental forgiveness phrases. And what I'll do is I'll give you the verses and you just pull out your favorite phrases that teach you a principle of forgiveness. And as usual, my phrases aren't the correct phrases. Uh, you very, very well may come up with something different. But I would like to share mine with you. And these all come from Mosiah 26, except just one that I'm going to pull out from chapter 25. 
So 2510. I love the phrase, the immediate goodness of God. Not just the goodness of God, but immediate goodness. And immediate can have two meanings. It can mean to be nearby or close to, like you have an immediate family member. God's goodness and mercy is always right there for us. It can also mean instantaneous or done at once. God is ever ready to lend us a listening ear and an understanding heart and a gracious pardon. He never leaves us. We only walk away from him. So like the parable of the prodigal son, as soon as that boy makes his way back home, his father's forgiveness is immediate. He doesn't even let his son explain before he's running to him and embracing him and planning a celebration for him. And and don't get me wrong here. I don't believe that repentance is immediate or easy. We're going to take a look at that principle later. But I do believe that forgiveness is. Chapter 26, verse 22. My favorite phrase, freely forgive. God is the type of being that can freely forgive. And some synonyms for freely, quickly, readily, willingly unreservedly, matter-of-factly, candidly, eagerly. God loves to forgive people. It's almost as if he's standing there with his hand out, just anticipating, waiting, hoping you'll reach out to it. And as soon as you do, he'll grab it and he'll forgive. That's just his character. Something that is free isn't paid for. We don't earn forgiveness any more than we earn our salvation or our exaltation. We don't earn our way into heaven. The forgiveness is given freely and willingly. The real work of repentance isn't trying to convince God to forgive us, and if I just do this and this, then eventually maybe I can convince God to forgive me. No, no, the real work of repentance is changing our hearts and our actions. That's the hard part. Chapter 26, verse 30. My favorite phrase here, as often. As in, as often as my people repent, will I forgive them. Forgiveness is not a one and done kind of thing any more than repentance is a one and done kind of thing. Some people feel that once they repent, that it's like they've used their get out of jail free card and If they fail again, well, then good luck ever being forgiven again. They picture God saying, you had your chance and you blew it, or three strikes and you're out. No, that's not it. The phrase is, as often as you repent, I'll forgive you as many times as your heart turns sincerely to me. God asks us to forgive until 70 times 7, and he'd never ask us to do something that he's not willing to do himself. God can and will forgive often and repeatedly. And then chapter 26, verse 31, the phrase here, forgive one another. I suppose that if there is a prerequisite or a condition to obtaining forgiveness, I guess this would be it. If somebody wanted to argue that forgiveness wasn't free, I guess they could point to this verse. The condition to forgiveness, forgiving your fellow man. So remember the parable of the unmerciful servant, where a man owes 10,000 talents to his Lord, and he has not wherewith to pay, and will never be able to pay it off. It is an unrepayable debt. And yet his master forgives him freely and immediately. But then that same servant demands payment of another man who owes him a very repayable debt, a small sum in comparison. And yet he won't do it. And in consequence of that, his Lord retracts his former forgiveness and delivers him into prison. So if somebody came to me as a bishop and asked what they needed to do to repent, maybe instead of going into an explanation of recognizing the sin, feeling remorse, making restitution, maybe I should just begin by saying, well, have you forgiven all others? Perhaps that's the critical first step we need to take 
if we ourselves wish to obtain forgiveness. God looks at us and says, I forgive immediately, freely, and as often as you need. Can't you do the same for your fellow man? Perhaps the real unpardonable sin is not forgiving other people. Well, with those phrases in mind, let's go into Mosiah 27. I don't believe it's a coincidence that Mosiah 27 comes after Mosiah 26. Besides the obvious reason, right? But thematically, the story of Mosiah 27 is the example used to illustrate the principles that were just taught in Mosiah 26. It's like Mormon is saying, I just showed you the principles of forgiveness in theory. Now, let's see them in action. Let me show you just how immediate God's goodness is. Let me show you how freely God can forgive. Let me show you how often he can forgive. This story in Mosiah 27, I think, is the archetypal story of forgiveness in the Book of Mormon. If I were to ask somebody what Book of Mormon stories come to mind when you say the word forgiveness, nine out of ten times, it's going to be Alma the Younger. His name is synonymous with forgiveness. So to begin a study of this story, I often do this little activity with my students to introduce a very important point to them. And I'll make this handout available to you for a download if you'd like to use it. But if you're not into handouts or activities like this, just take two colored pencils and mark these phrases in two different colors. And when I do this activity, I like to tell my students that we're going to compare and contrast two very different groups of people. They're going to search up the verses that are listed and fill in the blanks with the correct words. And those words should fit into the boxes next to them. Then they're going to use the numbered boxes to figure out the secret phrase that's going to teach them a principle. So our first group of people here. A very wicked and idolatrous man. That's in 27.8. Led many people to do after the manner of his wickedness. Also verse 8. A great hinderment to the prosperity of the church. 27.9. Stealing away the hearts of the people. Also verse 9. Giving a chance for the enemy of God to exercise his power over them. Also verse 9. He was going about to destroy the church of God. 27.10. They were going about rebelling against God. 27.11. And then they were the very vilest of sinners. And that's in chapter 28, verse 4. Sounds like a pretty rough group of people. Now, let's take a look at another group of people. What do we learn about them? He began from this time forward to teach the people. That's 2732. Preaching the word of God in much tribulation. Also verse 32. They did impart much consolation to the church. 2733. And thus they were instruments in the hands of God. That's 2736. And how blessed are they? 2737. They did publish peace. They did publish good tidings of good. Also verse 37. And then from chapter 28, verse 3, they were desirous that salvation should be declared to every creature. So with those answers in place, what is the secret message? People can change. Because I'm not sure if you caught this, but all of those phrases are describing the same group of young men. Alma the Younger and the four sons of Mosiah. Yes, I know that I said that these were two different groups of people, but really, in a sense, they are. Even Alma himself says that they became new creatures in 2726, a complete reversal of character. So may this story give hope to any of you who maybe have somebody that you love who has strayed, or even if it's you that is strayed. 
Remember that people can change, even when you least expect it. I could give you numerous examples of people that I know personally who were so far off the straight and narrow that you would never imagine them coming back. And yet they changed. Never give up hope in that possibility and never cease praying for it either. My grandpa is an example of this. My grandma is an example of this. Many people that I met on my mission are examples of this. Individuals in my ward are examples of this. It happens more often than you might think. But what happened here? What could make the very vilest of sinners into individuals who want salvation declared to every creature? What could change an idolatrous person into an instrument in the hands of God? What could possibly cause somebody who spent all their energy seeking to destroy the church to somebody who imparts much consolation to it? What happens here? Read Mosiah 27 to find out. And then I also invite you to study Alma 36, where he relates the story again to his son Helaman. It's a remarkable story that speaks for itself. And as you study, ask yourself what this story teaches you about repentance and forgiveness. So we find that Alma and the sons of Mosiah were visited by an angel. And then Alma goes into a kind of spiritual coma during which he suffers the pains of hell. And then he's filled with the spirit of forgiveness and joy. So I imagine that there's lots of parents out there that would like to line up one of these types of interventions for their own children. But there's something critical to mention here. I know that I've had some students make comments that revealed the assumption that they felt that Alma, the younger, was changed by the angel. That this happened because, well, it had to happen so that the church could grow in the future. Because God needed him on his side. I don't think so. I think the church would have been just fine without Alma the Younger and the four sons of Mosiah. I don't see the angel saying, Boys, you need to change so that you can all become amazing missionaries and one day lead the church. He doesn't say that. All I see is a stern warning to Alma to stop seeking to destroy the church, to discontinue his current path or be destroyed himself. It's also important to note that the angel says that his purpose for coming was to answer the prayers of his righteous father and the people, that their prayers might be answered. So this intervention wasn't really so much for Alma's sake as for the sake of the prayers of the faithful. And what happens next, I don't believe, is something forced on Alma the Younger. I think that this was his decision. He was deciding not only to heed the angel's warning, but to completely change his life around. This wasn't a withdrawal of Alma's agency. And I believe that God can do the same kind of thing for people today. Perhaps this is what we pray for on behalf of the people that we love. Some kind of warning experience or wake-up call that can give them the opportunity to change obviously always honoring their agency. We spoke about Noah moments a few lessons ago. Those can serve as these kinds of interventions. The loss of a loved one, an accident, a time of great opposition, a dream, the advice of a friend. All of these can serve as angels sent to try and turn people around. I know of a man who completely changed his life around after his mother died. It woke him up. I know of another individual who turned back to God and the word of wisdom after a cancer scare. That woke him up. And then I know of a woman who made great changes in her life after a very realistic dream that showed her where her life was heading in her current actions. And she changed. I believe that in circumstances like this, that God can send angels to give the wayward a chance to change. And it may not work. Uh, Laman and Lemuel had all sorts of these things happen, and they still rebelled. But God tried, and I think he'll try with our loved ones as well, especially if we're praying for it. 
Another principle that I love from this story is in the contrast, in the before and after. And the contrast here couldn't be more pronounced. There's another powerful marking activity that I like to do with my students here. With two different colors, mark all the words that describe how Alma felt before the atonement took effect in his life, uh, before he realized God for God's forgiveness, and how he felt after he received it. It's eye-opening. And let me walk you through them here in 27, 28 through 30. On the before forgiveness side, waiting through much tribulation. Uh, I like to hike, and a few years ago, uh, we hiked through a slot canyon in southern Utah called Buckskin Gulch. And there was a section of that canyon where we had to wade up to our chests in this dirty, muddy, smelly, foul-looking soup of sticks and filth to try to get to the other side. That's what that phrase makes me think of. Wading through much tribulation. Repenting nigh unto death. Everlasting burning. Gall of bitterness. Bonds of iniquity, like, like being wrapped up in chains. The darkest abyss. My soul was racked with eternal torment. Alma uses the word racked a lot of times to describe this experience. And to rack something is to cause extreme physical or mental pain. It's torture. In fact, there was even a medieval device of torture called the rack. So he's comparing the pains of sin to torture. Now on the other side of the spectrum, how does Alma describe his feelings after his experience? Soul redeemed. Now I beheld the marvelous light of God. My soul is pained no more. And then in Alma 36, verses 11 through 24, he's even more descriptive. Here's some more before words. Great fear, amazement, racked with eternal torment, harrowed up to the greatest degree. Now, a harrow is a farming tool with large spikes that is dragged across the dirt, tearing into the soil. Now, that's another very vivid image. Imagine a tool like that being raked across your heart and soul. So, if you want to sow your wild oats and then repent later, just remember that to get those wild oats out, you're going to have to use the harrow. Racked with all my sins, tormented with the pains of hell, the very thought of coming into the presence of my God did rack my soul with inexpressible horror. Oh, that I could be banished and become extinct, both soul and body. Racked even with the pains of a damned soul. Racked with torment. Harrowed up. Gall of bitterness. Encircled about by the everlasting chains of death. He's very detailed here. Anybody who thinks that repentance is easy should read this chapter. I think it's important to mention here that Alma didn't feel this way immediately after he sinned. Like, some individuals might rationalize sin by saying, well, I don't feel guilty for what I've done, so it must not be that big a deal. What you call sin doesn't bother me. I can imagine that there were years of Alma's life where he didn't even feel a tinge of remorse for his sins, for his murders. That's the word that he uses in verse 14. Now, he didn't actually murder anybody, but spiritually he did. He turned their souls away from God. So we've got to be careful of that rationalization and that thought. We may not feel chained and racked and harrowed at the moment, but that doesn't guarantee that we won't feel it at some point in the future. It will most likely come. But on the other side here, after the forgiveness comes, I could remember my pains no more. I was harrowed up by the memory of my sins no more. Oh, what joy! What marvelous light! My soul was filled with joy as exceeding as was my pain, to, to the exact degree. And we know how deep his suffering was. So 
his joy was just as high as his pain was deep. Exquisite and sweet as was my joy. Something that's exquisite is something that's intensely felt. My soul did long to be there. And that stands in stark contrast to how he felt just a few verses earlier, where even the thought of appearing before God filled his soul with horror. Exceeding joy filled with the Holy Ghost. Now that's quite the contrast, isn't it? You can't get any more opposite than those two descriptions. And what made the difference? Where does the switch come? What changed everything? And since we're here in Alma 36, read verses 17 through 19. And we find that it was the atonement and the thought of the mercy of Jesus Christ that changes everything. That's what makes the transformation possible. And what two-word phrase does he use to describe what his mind did with that thought? It caught hold upon that thought. I love that. Because Alma's drowning here. He's wading through affliction. He's in the darkest abyss. If you think back to Lehi's dream, he's in the filthy river, drowning in bitterness and pain. And as his head dips under the water, he has one last thought. Maybe that atonement, that Jesus that I heard my father speak about, will be there for me. And he reaches his hand out, just hoping to grasp something. And a hand catches hold on his. I remember when I was learning to swim that my parents had the incentive that if we could swim across the pool, they would take us to Dairy Queen for a peanut buster parfait. And I really wanted one of those. And so I swam my hardest across that pool. But I didn't quite make it. I overexerted myself and my arms gave out. And I started to flounder in the pool and gasp. And that's a terrible feeling, right? Nothing solid to grab onto or to step onto. I remember my head going under the water and reaching out my hand, just hoping to feel something solid. And what a relief it was to feel my father's hand grasp mine and lift me up out of the water. That's what Alma is experiencing here. He's feeling his father's hand grasp his. Now jump back to Mosiah 27 with me, and you'll find a very interesting companion word in both verse 28 and 29 to the phrase caught hold. Can you find it? He snatched him. Alma reaches out, and catches hold, and Christ's hand snatches him out of the river. That suggests something about Christ's forgiveness, doesn't it? It's that immediate, freely given type of forgiveness that we were talking about earlier. To snatch something suggests eagerness, readiness, quickness, like he's just waiting there, hand outstretched, saying, Come on, Alma, just ask for it. I'm ready waiting, willing. And as soon as Alma reaches out, Christ snatches him out of that pain and that torment. Sometimes I think that we view repentance as a negative word with, with negative connotations. I've got to repent. I think that to Alma, repentance was a beautiful word. Christ can and will do the same for you and I. If you ever feel yourself drowning in that guilt, that sorrow, that pain, that torment, the story of Alma the Younger is in the Book of Mormon to show you there's a way out. You don't have to feel that way forever. Reach out to your Savior from the depths of your pain. Cry out to Him. And I promise you there will be something to catch hold of. He will snatch you from the pain and the bitterness. And oh, It'll feel so good to be free from that guilt. If he was able to rejoice and embrace the marvelous light, so should you. 
And really, the fact of the matter is that the story of Alma the Younger's change is a kind of a bookend or an extreme example. The scriptures often present us with these stories where principles are pushed to their edges. And there's a reason for that. If a man as wicked and evil and rebellious as Alma the Younger can repent, then anybody can repent. If God can forgive a man who caused so much trouble for God's church, then God can forgive anyone. And not only that, if a man as vile as Alma could become the leader of the church, the prophet, then anybody who repents can not only return to full fellowship, but excel and even rise to leadership. Like the prodigal son who only wanted to return and be a servant, it was clear from the very outset that his father was going to treat him as a son. The same is true with us. When we return, we don't return as servants, but sons and daughters. And on the other end of that spectrum, we've got individuals like Nephi, who also sought for forgiveness. Remember 2 Nephi chapter 4, and he got forgiveness. Now, now the message you don't want people to walk away with from the story, especially the youth, is, oh, well, okay, I guess I can live it up like Alma the Younger and rebel and do what I want now, and then later I'll fix everything like he did. That's not the point of the story. We don't have a lot of Alma the Younger and Sons of Mosiah type stories in the scriptures, but there are a few. Paul also comes to mind. But for every Alma the Younger, we've got 10 Nephi's. For every Paul, we have 10 Peters. I think God prefers us to be Nephi's and Stripling Warriors and Joseph Smith's and Samuel's. But the Alma the Younger, four sons of Mosiah, Paul stories are in there too. And they serve a very important purpose. If God can forgive both a Nephi and an Alma the Younger, these two bookends, then I'm bound to fall somewhere in between. Therefore, I have hope. You have hope. We fall into that glorious range of grace. I know that sometimes individuals find it hard to forgive themselves, maybe even after they've been assured by a priesthood leader that they've been forgiven. Or what if you're a person whose life is free of serious sin, and you're nowhere near the sinner Alma was, but you still find yourself getting discouraged and sorrowful, because you don't feel you measure up to what you could be. This story has a lesson for you, too. If God can forgive somebody in open rebellion, then how do you think he's going to treat somebody who's striving, who's trying, who actually wants to be good? A few questions here for you to consider before we conclude. Has God ever sent you, or somebody you love, an angel, to help you or them to change? And what happened? And then, of course, without revealing any past transgressions, we don't want to do that, how would you describe the feeling of forgiveness? What would you compare it to? And then, how does the story of Alma the Younger give you hope? Now, there's a challenge with teaching repentance to a group of students sometimes. Some, you feel, may need one message emphasized, while the others need the opposite side of the coin. You might even feel like splitting the room in two and teaching one message to this side and the other message to that side. Some need the carrot message, others need the stick. The thing about the Alma the Younger story is that it does a pretty good job of teaching both. The awfulness of sin and the hopefulness of mercy. But if I had to choose which one that I felt was emphasized, I'd say that it's the mercy and forgiveness side. The reaching, snatching, catching hold hand of Christ. The story of Alma the Younger and the Sons of Mosiah is the embodiment of the immediate goodness of God. The freely forgiving God. The as oft as they repent God. Alma the Younger is the prodigal son, 
the scarlet sinner who became white as snow. And I know that I've felt, and, and I'm sure that you have too, a measure of the bitterness of sin, the harrow, the rack, and the pain of regret. I'm so grateful for God's incredibly forgiving nature. I felt that relief. I felt that joy that comes from catching hold of the hand of the Savior. He's lifted me. He's saved me. And I know that he'll do the same for you. And he'll do it as often as you need it. And freely. And immediately. Well, we'll conclude there for this week. I hope you enjoyed the lesson and found value in its principles. If you did, I invite you to share it with somebody that you feel it can help. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I'd love it if you did that. We'll see you next week. Thank you for watching. And as always, get out there and teach with power.